I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. And uh, Chris has volunteered to do our invocation tonight. Thank you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, we give you thanks for you are the creator of all life and goodness. Thank you for giving us an organization like the LEA. A righteous man is not naive. He knows how evil works. And so he is on guard against it. If I received a message from the worst fiends of an inferno, there is nothing I should expect so much as the message that everything is bright and breezy and that there is no peril. These are the words of G.K. Chesterton. Loving God, help us to be faithful heralds of healing and hope. Thank you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Thank you all. So what we'd like to do is let our, uh, our honorees and our speaker go uh, grab their dinner first so they'll have a chance to, to eat before we get going with the program. Since this is uh, an official meeting, in a sense, of the members of the LEA, we have a little bit of official business to do, and that starts with an election. And that's uh, something Ben is going to come up and, and organize here. Well, I'm Ben Rickers, and I'm vice chair of LEA. And Thanks for everybody coming tonight. It's great. Uh, this should be kind of uh, short and sweet. We have four members that are up for re-election, or up for the uh, four board openings. And three of the people that were in board, were serving, have agreed to serve again. Uh, Gordon Anderson, Alex Bednar, uh, Mark Olson, uh, Marty Prost, who was serving last year, has decided he, he's going to serve in a different way. He's, he's still very active, but he moved on from the LEA, so we kind of thank him for his effort. But uh, the positive two things, I guess. One is um, we do have an opening, and so if you're interested, uh, you can contact me or John or Don or any of us, and uh, uh, we'd be happy to entertain you know, bringing you on, maybe having you visit a board meeting. Uh, you might end up liking to be a part of the board. You might want to be an advisor. There's, there's roles for you if you're interested in, in helping putting this uh, analysis and report together. So be, uh, be thinking about that uh, if you have any interest in doing that. But since we, are, we have three people who have agreed to serve and we're, we have spots for four. We're going to be able to do this really quick because I'm going to suggest that we do, that we elect Gordon, Alex, and Mark by acclamation. So I guess what I need is a motion to do that. And, uh, and we need a second. Perfect. And I'd like to, is there any discussion? Uh, yeah, well, you know, in the private sector, bad ideas go away. Um, so, so <laughs> that's not the private sector. <laughs> so uh, all those in favor, please say aye. All those oppo opposed? Okay, great. So that's, 
Oh, you missed the opportunity, but go ahead. So what would a board member do so that you can explain that to somebody that would be interested in the Sure, uh, I'd love to. Um, what are you signing up to do? That's a great idea. So what do we do is, is we evaluate bills in the process of evaluating legislators. So we're, the idea is to say, to provide information to voters so they have some uh, insight about who they're, um, who they're supporting and why they're supporting them. So basically, if you look at one of our reports, you'll see that there is a, basically it's a three paragraph approach. It's the first paragraph is what was the bill, an analysis of the bill, and the third paragraph is, what do we think about that? Do we think we would have supported it or not? And then we use that as a test against how the legislators actually voted. So that's, that's, the, that's the core thing we do, and then we kind of pick the bills that we think are important for a variety of reasons, maybe from a process standpoint, maybe for the amount of money involved, uh, but we pick 17 to 20 bills typically, sometimes as few as maybe 15 or 16, but that's basically what we do. It's a lot of, uh, it, it kind of, it's, a, it's, a, it's work that kind of goes in um, not too much, and then when legislature uh, is done in May, there's a ton of work that follows that to get the report out more or less as quickly as we can. And so, so that's when the work is, and it's usually, um, a couple of hours, a few hours, maybe a little work outside of the meetings every couple of weeks during the summertime. And so that's, that's a challenge if you're uh, trying to come from the golf course, but uh, it's not too bad because I'm coming from the golf course sometimes when I come to those meetings. Um, so that's, that's, what, that's the main thing we do, but we're also trying, and, and Don and his wife are, are working on really trying to expand what the LEA does, and I don't know if you're gonna talk about that a little bit later on, and so I won't, I won't seal this under by going there, but it, it's a commitment of time. It's very, you learn a ton about the bill making process. I think that's one of the things that I would say if people ask me about, well, why, what have you enjoyed about the LEA uh, since I've been a member, and it has been, there is, there is, you get an insight into what really is going on that you won't get certainly reading the Star Tribune, um, just as an example. So, um, so I don't know if I, I kind of wandered on a long time. Did I answer your question decently? Okay, great. Any other questions before I uh, turn this back over to Don? All right, great, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I, I get to say a few words now, and uh, I want to echo some of what, uh, what Ben has said. It's been a great learning experience. I, I want to point out that when I joined the LEA, I started as an advisor, and the thing that drew me to LEA was that it was not an organization that was big on guns or taxes or abortion. It was an organization that focused on process and on the simple premise that the legislators should follow their oaths and follow the Constitution as written. Uh, I, I, I just found that pretty amazing because in politics almost everybody who has enthusiasm has some issue that they're pushing and when they go to the legislators they want something uh, and that's not what LEA has done. We're, we're about process, we're about doing it right, we're about the fundamentals. Uh, so, so anyway, thank you for being here. I'm Don Lee, I'm, I'm president of LEA. Uh, we're grateful for your support and your membership and for your presence here tonight. You're the leaders who know things and get involved. Like it or not, you're the ones that your friends and neighbors ask when they need to know something about politics or what's going on in the world. And they value your opinions and we value your support. LEA began back in, what, 1972? It's been around a long time. We focus on basic principles of good government and founding principles. We try hard to bring you an annual report based on fundamentals rather than politics. You make our work possible. Our six, I need my glasses here. I miss my eyes. 
Our six honorees this evening are those rare political leaders who try hard to follow those principles and who understand that government is not just a grab bag of goodies. They remind us that everything has a cost and voting no on popular proposals is sometimes necessary. So, thank you. This year, we're trying something new at LEA. You've noticed my, my wife over at the table there. Uh, it's always been a struggle to get our report finished and published on time and have appropriate impact on election year. This is made more difficult when the legislature moves up the primary to early August, and then they pack all the most important work into the last couple of weeks of the legislative session, giving us minimal time to get stuff done, to get analyzed, I mean, they don't even get a chance to read the bills. We get at least a couple of weeks to look at them, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, so they pack the last couple of weeks in the legislative session, or even worse, into a one-day special session that occurs after the legislation has, uh, legislature has adjourned. We're not real fond of that. But what we're trying to do this year is we want to recruit researchers to help us drink from the fire hose and get that report out on time and with high quality. We will train them to follow the legislature, and we, they will help us track and summarize the legislature's work as the session proceeds. As you know, there are typically thousands of bills introduced every session, most of which don't go anywhere, but there's, that's a lot to track. We want to maximize the scrutiny and simplify the work done by the board by getting help in that initial fielding of the bills allowing the board to focus on the principled analysis that we require. As a side benefit, everyone who attends our training sessions will be equipped with tools to follow our legislature and hold legislators accountable. It's all good. The way I look at it, the more eyes we have on the legislature and using what I see as a really great resource in that legislative website, uh, the better off we are. If you're interested in being one of those researchers, please sign up at the, with one of the clipboards on the tables or speak to my, my wife, Connie, uh, at the information table. She's right over there. Even if you're not available to volunteer, please consider attending one or more of the training sessions. This is useful information for all the citizens of Minnesota. Thank you all for your support. We hope you enjoy our speaker, John Gizzi, who, where'd he go? <laughs> he ran away. <laughs> And uh, that's all I have to say. So we, we're going to hand out the rewards now. Sure, go ahead. I'm going to pass these clipboards around the room. It, your name and email address and zip code on here does not obligate you to be a researcher at all, but it does say, yes, I'd like to know when you're having a training session in my neighborhood. So that's why I want zip codes. So uh, if you're not interested, just pass it on. But if anybody wants to uh, have a chance to attend a local training session, please put your name on here. OK, so now we get to the good part. We present the awards. And the first one is uh, Gordon is going to present the award to uh, Mr. Draskowski. I'm just, uh, I'm not going to take a lot of time here, but thank you. Um, thanks for all you do in helping hold us accountable uh, to the Constitution and the process. Now, uh, we have a new caucus in the Minnesota House of Representatives, and one of our key areas has been focusing on omnibus bills and trying to decrease the use of those omnibus bills and move to a process that allows raw votes on each provision as it comes through. And we're dedicated to moving back towards that. Hopefully you can help us grow that presence, grow that um, action here in Minnesota over the next few years, and that'll help our process be better, it will help the outcome be better, and it will help us be more accountable as a legislature to the people of Minnesota. Thank you. Second honoree is John Heinrich, and uh, Alex is going to present him with his 
Alex Bednar. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Everybody's taller than me. Uh, <clears throat> hey, thanks so much. Uh, thank you for the excellent dinner this evening. And, uh, and I know so many friends and, and people here that got to have conversations with. Um, really an honor uh, to be here with you all tonight. Uh, as a freshman legislator, I'm just learning the ropes, so to speak, in a lot of areas, but uh, I didn't know that you guys were keeping track, but apparently you were. We and uh, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for what you do. I think it probably does make a, a large difference in, uh, in how legislators vote, and we need that. We need that attention on our votes in St. Paul. Thanks so much. Next, Ben Rickers is going to present the, the award to Mr. Hurtos. I've been accused that that's not easy for me to do. Um, well, thank you very much. I'm honored to uh, receive another award from LEA. Uh, when I decided to uh, run for the legislature, I came from a business background, mainly in the construction and uh, building trades, uh, custom home builder. And uh, one thing that has disturbed me over the last many years is how Minnesota has been losing its edge in uh, the tax competitive arena. And uh, although when you're a freshman, you don't always get to be assigned to the committees you'd like to serve on, I have uh, taken great pleasure to serving on those committees which are more finance related rather than policy related. So with that in mind, um, I had a visit from the Minnesota Business Chamber today uh, pointing out that their new rankings of Minnesota that some of the efforts that I led with regard to the Minnesota State General Levy, the taxes on business and commercial property, uh, and because of the progress that we made when we were in the majority, actually has a uh, improved Minnesota's standing among, amongst the 50 states, so they were thanking me for doing that. Thank you. Next, uh, John Augustine will introduce uh, Eric Lucero. Once again, we are pleased to have a Representative Eric Lucero here to receive a reward, proving nearly daily that style and substance do not have to be mutually exclusive. Thank you, everybody. It is so great to see so many friends out here tonight. And uh, I was talking to, who was it earlier today? Oh, it was Mary Emla. No, it was Marge, actually. It was Marge. Marge Holston. So I, I'm, I've gone through fifth. I'm going into my sixth year as, my, as a third-term member, into my sixth year for voting, which means I have five years behind me. And I believe I've received uh, the LEA award each of the five years. So I'm fortunate for that. <laughs> However, the qualifier I'll put on that is I'm happy to receive the award, but to be honest, it's really not that hard. Going in there and simply voting for the truth, voting for the Constitution, if that results, I mean, that is not hard. 
And that's what results in a ward, fantastic. But I'm gonna keep on just voting for the truth and voting for our constitutional rights and liberties. So thank you again. Our next award is, oh. yeah, good man. Our next award is for Shane Makeland. Am I saying that right? Meckland. Oh, good Lord, I'm going to touch all this. So, like Mr. Heinrich, or Representative Heinrich said, being a freshman, you learn a lot. Um, like Representative Hurtas says, I also come from the trades. I started this being completely frustrated and absolutely pissed off at government. Sorry for the word, but sometimes passion is more important. Um, my main thing I campaigned on is I will not flex bender waiver. I believe I've done that so far. And I don't plan to change. Uh, I was told in the beginning that you'll get your arm twisted, you'll be told, you, can, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. There was a little, and I said no. Way to go. So, thank you. And rounding out the list is uh, Jerry Mewanson, and presented by uh, Chris uh, Wolf. I just want to say something about Jeremy first. He's from 23B. He uh, is on the Health and Human Services Finance Division, Housing Finance and Policy Division, and Long-Term Care. He's a business consultant in regulatory compliance, and I asked him before, and he says that he does not grow hops on his farm anymore, but <laughs> he still has five acres of hops that Oh, they're dead. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you know you're a, a fiscally conservative organization when your award is this small. <laughs> but but I, I, I plan on tiling my wall with these, so it, it's, as long as I'll be in the legislature, uh, well, I'll be collecting these. This is my, I, I was elected two years ago last week, so just, it was at a special election. So I've been through three sessions. I think I've got three of these. Um, you're a wonderful organization. Uh, we, need, we need more, uh, we just need more people to learn about you. Um, the ACU came here to do an award ceremony for conservatism, and basically everybody that has an R after their name got one. Um, and people who really need to know about omnibus bills in the process, and that's what I'm so passionate about. Like Draz said, we oppose omnibus bills. Um, when I was elected, I came in, I was sworn in like a few days before session started, and I got in and started just shredding bills and committees. I was so excited, and then finally somebody took me aside and said, we're in the majority, these are all Republicans' bills. <laughs> so, you know, but I didn't care. You know, I stood up on the House floor and railed against the bonding bill, and you could see Erdahl just go crazy because, you know, he was mad. Uh, but it, somebody needs to do that. Somebody needs to actually pull us back to the right, and so your organization uh, scores this correctly, and I thank you for all the work you do, and I, I, we, do, do, we do need more volunteers to track these bills and help score them because uh, a lot of these bills are so complex, and um, there's a million reasons why you can vote no, um, there's not much reason why you should vote yes for a lot of these bills. So, so thank you for everything you do. I think we chose well. Uh, our next uh, agenda is uh, we're getting to our speaker, and uh, John Augustine is uh, the one to introduce him. All right, just before I give my remarks, I just want to uh, add that uh, LEA is an all-volunteer grassroots organization. And uh, not only our reports, but at the banquet here tonight, 
is uh, the product of uh, people do do donating their time and talents. We have a videographer here doing it for much less than cost. We have another one who came from Duluth who's doing it for free. We have a photographer who's donating his services. And we ha have had a, a wonderful experience at this uh, ven our venue here for the first time here, Jimmy's Event Center. And they were very reasonable in, in uh, negotiation for, for pricing and options as well. So I want to thank the staff here for that. And uh, with that, I can move on to introducing the keynote speaker. So I realize a few of you tonight knew of this distinguished gentleman who has come here to visit with us and speak at our banquet. <clears throat> but for a lot of you, the question first made famous by Ross Perot's running mate is in order. Who is John Gizzy and why is he here? <laughs> he doesn't have the name recognition of a famous politician or even a syndicated commentator, although his latest job with Newsmax likely has made him a more recognizable face when out in public than he was for most of his career. He's a husband, a man of faith, who has amassed a treasure trove of stories and wisdom while building a long career covering politics, not only in our nation's capital, but also outside the United States and in states across the nation. Once you come into contact with him, he's an unforgettable character. Could make for an interesting book someday when he finally dials back his coverage of daily political events. Who else in journalism? fills his Twitter feed with 50-year-old historical parallels to current events and dresses as if he belongs in one of those classic movies that has been colorized. <laughs> Through his long involvement with internships arranged by the National Journalism Center, he has met a mentor to many others who sought roles in journalism, including myself. Let me take you to a time, the summer of 1992, that's more than 15 years ago, by the way, <laughs> where I first worked with John Gizzy. My wife, Monica, and my daughter, Amanda, who are here tonight, can only imagine what it was like. After participating in some Leadership Institute programs, a few small political jobs, and doing some writing for a small college newspaper, I was accepted into the National Journalism Center's summer internship program. NJC was founded by conservative journalists and specialized in giving students who are not journalism majors the training and hands-on experience to pursue jobs in the media. The interns lived together in housing a few blocks from Capitol Hill, received a small stipend to help with basic living expenses, and were placed with a variety of media companies around the Beltway. The intern house had one small TV and a community car that people used at their own risk to get basic groceries or go where mass transit did not. You could see the cord sticking out of the tires. No one put more than a few dollars of gas in at a time because any day could be the last for that car. One time, a couple of us had to push it half a block to a gas station after being in the car for less than a mile. So some housemates got to work at CNN there was no Fox or Newsmax yet, much less any online-only conservative news sites. Another of my housemates, Raymond Arroyo, got his start interning as a researcher for the Evans and Novak syndicated column, before eventually becoming a news anchor for EWTN and a published author. Joe Hainthaler was in the same household as housemate as I was too, and he worked in human events offices as a, as a position, of, position of copy editor a position that may soon be declared an endangered species, unfortunately. I got to work at a national conservative newspaper, Human Events, with John Gizzy and the rest of the gang there. Every workday, this native, cold weather loving Minnesotan would sweat through my formal attire while walking to and from the transit stops to the building where Human Events was, often dodging a few panhandlers while I was carrying a briefcase who foolishly thought just because I was formally dressed I had a lot of money to throw around. I already knew some basic research skills from my experience in debate, politics, and school newspapers. Human Events, which was much different than the site that goes by the name of Human Events today, taught me how to deal with different people to find and print information that would interest their readership. The central characters in Human Events offices had a variety of styles and backgrounds. 
People smoked. Those of us who didn't weren't obsessed with banning them from doing so. Christian, Jewish, different races and ethnicities. No one there seemed to be staking claims to knowledge through identity politics. People brought their various backgrounds and talents together to provide the best product to their readership and to the company as a whole. Editor Alan Riskin's office was stacked high with reports from various agencies and organizations. He would dig through them and come up with some remarkable news stories. I learned, my family can probably tell you this, perhaps too well, that you didn't have to have a tidy work environment to do the job. At the other end of the style spectrum was John Gizzi, who seemed to be always engaged in conversations to flesh out his stories. He became known for the amazing size and range of his Rolodex's sources, which he would go back to years after first being in contact with them. I learned that it wasn't intimidating when working for a newspaper to interview high-profile people such as the mayor of Miami, Florida, or the number two person at Geffen Records, as long as you were prepared, asked fair questions, and respected their time. They're people just like anyone else. I was happy to be a source of information when John chose to write about Minnesota politics long after my internship ended. If for no other reason than to counter the line that Vin Weber and like-minded operatives were always trying to feed him. It even led me to getting a human events byline in 2009 with a profile of Tim Pawlenty when he began exploring a presidential run. John Gizzi helped get that published. We made an effort to stay in touch over the years. Finally, after a few years of discussion, John agreed to come to the political and media wilderness of Minnesota. To support LEA with its unique and important mission and to share his well-formed insights and vast knowledge with a population that deserves greater exposure to them. And so now, without further ado, I present to you on behalf of LEA, John Gizzi. Thank you, John. Thank you, John, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I begin my remarks, I just have to say uh, I am awestruck by the crowd, and I only wish with all my heart that there were two people here who could not be here tonight, my mom and dad. Mom made it to 92, dad to 97, because they would have most appreciated John's warm and poignant remarks. I think my mother would have been impressed and my father would have been amazed. <laughs> so thank you. If my voice sounds a little gruff or a little rough tonight. I hope you'll pardon me. I came in on a flight last night that was so small the pilot had to radio in to ask what time it was. The surprising answer he got from the tower was, well what airline are you flying on? And the pilot says, well what does that have to do with the time? To which the tower responded, if you're with American Airlines or United Airlines, it's eight o'clock. If you're with BOAC or Air France, it's 0800 hours. If you're with Southwest Airlines, the big hands on the 12 and the little hands on the 7. <laughs> it's a special treat to be here in Minnesota tonight. I think a lot of us who cover politics love Minnesota because you've given us the colorful and the men and women of certainty and consequence. Look back at your history for generations. Floyd Olson, the governor of Minnesota, the Bernie Sanders of his day. Harold Stassen, the boy governor, who by one year, by being elected at age 31, kept the title of youngest governor in the US from 32-year-old Bill Clinton of Arkansas. And of course, Hubert Humphrey, Gene McCarthy, and Walter Mondale, all were major players in the national political scene. And the first two women sent to the House from each major party who were Minnesotans were also women of consequence. Democrat Koya Knudsen, elected in 1954, and a friend of many here, Republican Michelle Bachman. And of course, more recently, we've seen the elections of Paul Wellstone, another precursor of Bernie Sanders, of Al Franken, Jesse Ventura, 
and most recently, Congresswoman Ilhan uh, Abdullahi Omar. Very simply put, uh, it's a pleasure to come here because one thing for a political reporter that he or she can say about Minnesota, it's never boring here. Now, I do have to say a word of thanks to John Augustine. It is true, he was our intern at Human Events and he was rock solid then and he's rock solid today. We have made an effort to keep in touch and he's been invaluable uh, helping me over the years when I would say someone was conservative who didn't meet his high standards he would call me and his, in his own shy and retiring way would say you're wrong <laughs> so I'm very grateful for John thank you all Now before I begin my remarks as a White House correspondent, let me also give an observation to you. Uh, all of us, small businessmen, uh, people who run their own business, people like John Spry who teach, others here know that change is apparent and in a very rapid way in all that we do for livelihood. I certainly have seen change as a reporter. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, I hated people who said when I was a kid. Now I say it all the time. When I was a young reporter, I sent in stories on a manual typewriter. And for those of you not familiar with it, let me share a definition from my old friend, Lynn Nofziger, an old Copley reporter before he joined Ronald Reagan's team. A typewriter combines the functions of a word processor and a printer. Now, it is inarguable that I've benefited from learning the computer, from having a laptop, from going to a primarily print publication to one that has strong roots being online. It's been more exposure for me and the stories that I like to bring to the attention of the public. But at the same time, I can't help but recall the words of Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes that change simply for the sake of change is change without merit. Let me give you a case in point, and it's something that I wrestle with every day. Is it good to simply rush a story and put it online without double checking and getting that all important second source? all in the name of collecting the almighty clicks on the story posted. And frankly, is it good to simply have anonymous sources for a story as important and probative as it is without having at least one name identified? And finally, with the net, we can all read just what we want. Is it good? to put together our own little electronic newspaper with stories we agree with and pundits we side with and thus avoid dissenting opinions and in the process just lead to an echo chamber around ourselves which leads to a divisive body politic. These are things that I think we should all think about and consider. With that, welcome to the Trump administration. Now, Donald Trump is somebody that I first met in 2013 when he was just thinking about running for president. I've had two private, off-the-record sessions with him in the White House, and I'm proud to say that he usually calls on me when he's boarding Marine One and faces the fourth estate at the White House. Um, just some thoughts on him and the press. First of all, it is said that he's a vengeful and vindictive person. That's not true at all. In fact, a little known story is how after the impeachment debacle, he contacted Adam Schiff, Nancy Pelosi, and Jerry Nadler and asked them to go on a high-level fact-finding mission to Wuhan, China. <laughs> Andrew, I thought you'd appreciate that. Um, now, 
The president is someone who would tell you if he was here that he's answered more questions and had more give and take reporters with reporters than any president in history. Well, what he means is taking the questions from folks like me at the helicopter or in the Oval Office after he introduces a world leader with whom he's had a meeting. Now, he may well be right for one term. I have a funny feeling with four terms, FDR had a few more exchanges with reporters at the time. But what this does has simply replaced the very familiar press briefing that one used to see every day on television. Those briefings were a staple of the White House since 1933. They were televised for the first time in 1996. And at the time of their cancellation in 2019, they were actually beating Jeopardy and Young and the Restless in the ratings in public. They were a staple of Americana. Now, do most of us who cover the White House miss them and miss the opportunities for follow-up questions after and to have the Q&A and the give and take with the president's top spokesman televised? You bet we are. And I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Someone else who is, is Sarah Sanders. She was just hitting her stride as the president's top spokesman and indeed, she was getting much better at jousting with Jim Acosta every day. And then the president pulled the plug on it. Or, as she would say, someone with a higher pay grade had the last word. Now, please don't take my word for it. Ask her that when she comes to Minnesota in April or read her book. Now, this is a president and this is an administration that feels it doesn't need press briefings. The president thinks he's his own best spokesman. And in fact, there is a case for this. He feels that way because of Twitter. Let it be said that Donald Trump is to Twitter, what FDR was to radio and Jack Kennedy was to television. He's put it on the political map. And quite frankly, we all saw last week how Attorney General Barr said, and I quote, it's impossible for me to do my job because of the president's tweets. Now the president didn't reprimand him, didn't make a cutting comment, didn't fire him. He's heard it all before. Privately, between us, a past chief of staff to President Trump told me, he went to the president and said, if only you would stop tweeting your face would be on the $20 bill someday. Well, he didn't and he won't. And let me just go back to a joint press conference that President Trump had with German Chancellor Angela Merkel in 2017. He was asked point blank, did he regret any of the tweets that he had unleashed on the public? And he said, not many of them because without Twitter, I wouldn't be standing before you today. Now, I had a wise editor who told me once that receipts are a reporter's best friend. In Trump world, leaks are a reporter's best friend. That's right. Most of the major stories you read about, ranging from the appointment of the two Supreme Court justices to the recent speculation that the president favors a tax break and tax incentive for people who invest in the stock market. All of those originate with a high administration source or a senior administration official, hence the leaks. And quite frankly, this reporter speaks with experience on leaks. At a time when the Secretary of Labor held a press conference to insist that controversy notwithstanding he was going to stay exactly where he was, sources high in the Labor Department said he would be gone soon. And he was gone soon, three days in fact, after he had the press conference to argue the contrary. Uh, when the speculation began that White House Chief of Staff John Kelly was going to leave his position, a high-level source told me, ignore the speculation about Governor Chris Christie 
or Nick Ayers, Chief of Staff to the Vice President, as his successor. The next Chief of Staff would be Mick Mulvaney, Director of the Office of Management and Budget. And sure enough, that happened a short time later. I might add that my source came to me in the men's room of the Marriott Marquis Hotel in Washington to share this secret. Now, it is said that all leakers in the White House are equal, but some are more equal than others. Witness the case of Anonymous. I'm sure you've heard about the book that's come out by a high-level official working in the White House. It really doesn't reveal anything that we didn't know already, but it certainly bothers a lot of people, including numero uno, that someone is writing a book while on the White House payroll. And I can tell you, Anonymous will be known to the public and she will be gone from her position quite soon. Just keep that in mind. Now, let me conclude with a little mention about Donald Trump himself and policy, uh, or as John Augustine used to call it, the substance. Uh, the fact is that policy is critical to this administration. And to discuss Donald Trump without discussing his policies would be like, oh, casting the first act of Hamlet without the gravediggers. Uh, this is a president who, if you try to compare him to any past president, any president in American history, you won't be able to do it. In order to find an accurate comparison, one has to go across the Atlantic. And the person who most resembles him is one Silvio Berlusconi, the multibillionaire um, communications magnate in Italy, owner of a winning soccer team, and someone who came to the office of prime minister four times and never held office before. Does it sound familiar? Like Donald Trump, Berlusconi came from a comfortable family background, and he turned that comfortable family fortune into a multi-billion dollar colossus. He was a colorful character, and just as Donald Trump was known in New York as the Donald, Silvio Berlusconi was known throughout Rome as Il Cavallari, the Knight. Both men have made multiple trips to the altar and make no secret of their pride in being called ladies' men. And both, interestingly, while having an overall conservative record, are willing to apply uh, a treatise from the business world that if something different is going to work, then try it, just so long as it works. Berlusconi, for example, surprised a lot of people during his first mandate as prime minister when he ended conscription for the Italian military. Donald Trump totally leaves Medicare and Social Security off the table. In other words, the two biggest causes of the deficit are not addressed by the administration because he knows that that third rail is going to be electric. Now, when you look at the rest of his policies, if you insist on trying to compare him to an American politician, one has to go back a few years and look at someone who ran for president and didn't make it. That's Pat Buchanan who ran a quarter of a century ago. In his most successful run for president, he laid out the groundwork for a manifesto that for the most part was adopted by Donald Trump. In other words, Pat Buchanan's legacy is Donald Trump's agenda. The obvious case in point is using trade as a weapon to get other countries to go along with one's policy. And certainly the president's emphasis on changing the judiciary to the point of outsourcing judicial nominees to the Heritage Foundation and to the Federalist Society comes right from the book of Buchanan. Pat Buchanan, in fact, in his last book, devotes a whole chapter to his belief that the Nixon administration he served so loyalty totally dropped the ball in the selection of judges including at the level of the Supreme Court. And of course, 
What we call today the border wall, or Trump's border wall, was a quarter century ago the Buchanan fence. And what was Pat Buchanan's slogan when he ran for president? America first. And there's one other change in Donald Trump that's almost a seismic change in foreign policy. Under the last two presidents, encouraging countries that the United States dealt with to become democratic was not only a high priority, it was an imperative. George W. Bush said as much in his second inaugural address in 2005. Barack Obama, in his now celebrated and storied Cairo speech of June 4th, 2009, said that, not only emphasizing democracy in the Middle East, but women's rights and religious liberties as well. Donald Trump doesn't address things in such lofty terms. In fact, his bottom line is, if a country is going to work with the United States, then it can do whatever it wants on the domestic front. Hence, there's been minimal criticism of Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, even after the bloody death of the journalist Khashoggi. The President says next to nothing critical and in fact praises Fatal el-Sisi, the President of Egypt, a diametric contrast to the approach that Barack Obama took to Hosni Mubarak, the strongman President of Egypt, 10 years ago and thus ignited the Arab Spring. And let me share with you a story in foreign policy that's little known but poignant. Last Easter, the President jolted official Washington when he had a long and very warm telephone call with Libyan Field Marshal Khalifa Haftar. Now, that name may not mean a lot to you, Marshal Haftar controls most of the country of Libya with his headquarters in Benghazi. He is a former chief of staff to uh, Colonel Gaddafi and someone who is openly contemptuous of democracy. And what is interesting is he now seeks to overthrow through civil war the government in Tripoli of Prime Minister Fayez El Sarraj who is backed, on paper at least, by the United States, the European Union, and the United Nations. What one wonders is the President doing talking to the sworn enemy of someone the U.S. supports? The answer lies with his then National Security Advisor, John Bolton, who believes that someone who is a strongman is the person best equipped to deal with the militias, and with the American hating Islamists. Now, I can tell you this. Newsmax broke the story that Bolton arranged the phone call. I will not say where that source was that gave that story to us. But in fairness to President Trump, his overall record, as I said, is conservative and one all conservatives could be proud of. 67 executive orders mandating deregulation in business and industry, a budget, a Tax and Jobs Act, rather, that not only uh, generated and jump-started the economy, but actually removed the mandates required by the Affordable Care Act and set up the stage for another court test of Obamacare and the new budget that has just come out, which while not tackling entitlements, performs strong vivisection on many of the big spending projects, the pork barrel that we all hear about in departments such as the Environmental Protection Agency, AmeriCorps, and the Department of Education. All told, Donald Trump is a conservative, but it's not your father's conservatism. I think of a call recently I had to make to American Express to work out a dispute in my bill, and I learned that I'd reached a service manager in Manila in the Philippines. Now, I've been following their president, President Duterte, who is an anti-establishment figure, profane, and totally unpredictable. 
That's some president you have there, I told the service man. He replied, that's some president you have there. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a very nice evening for me, very moving, and it's been a pleasure to get to know you. We've got some important days ahead, and for the lawmakers here, days of uncertainty. But as the Peruvian Nobel laureate Mario Vargas Llosa once said, uncertainty is a flower whose petals have yet to be picked. We don't know what the future will bring, but we know that no matter what defeats come, people like Eric and like John and Jeff and so many others are going to press forward, knowing in their hearts that Cicero was right when he said politics is not static. If the good times must come to an end, so must the bad times. As I leave you, let me leave you with some words from a poet, Nguyen Tri Chien. He was from Vietnam, and for years he used his powers of verse, his mastery of sarcasm and humor to challenge the communist regime. For his trouble, he was sentenced to 27 years in prison. And there he went, tortured to the limit of human endurance, forced to endure hard labor beneath the Southeast Asian sun, and denied even a pencil and paper with which to write his verse down. But ah, he had a far more potent tool for recalling and committing verse, his memory. When he was finally released, he wrote down all he had committed to memory, 400 poems and verses. He put them on little paper, and he stuffed them within his underclothing and his suit. And then he went to the British Embassy in Hanoi. He began to act like a fool, throwing water in people's face, turning over tables, until he was finally arrested. And the British sentries then searched him, and they found the papers. They knew just what to do. They sent them in a diplomatic pouch to his publisher in London. Let me share just two of them with you. They exiled me to the heart of the jungle, wishing to fertilize the shrubs with my remains. But I became an expert hunter and came out with snake wisdom and rhino fierceness. They sent me into the ocean, wishing I would never return from the depths. But I became a deep sea diver and came up with many scintillating pearls. On October 9th, 2012, Gwyn Tri Chin died, but his words, published in the form of Voices of Hell, live on. He's the Solzhenitsyn of Vietnam. Keep in mind his words and his inspiration. Lawmakers, members of the LEA, and those of us who report on you, continue to go out and do your mission. Develop and face problems with rhino fierceness and snake wisdom, and you will come up with many scintillating pearls. As conservatives, as LEA friends and supporters, you can do no less. Thank you, and good night. You wouldn't care to talk me into an encore, would you? I'll tell you what, John, in August of 2008, I lost an old friend, and he was someone who could deliver as good a speech as anyone I knew, and he was most expert at answering questions. When you ask Tony Snow something, you got an answer. And I always said, thank you, Tony, when he concluded answering my questions. In memory of him and dedicated to him, I'd like to take a few of your questions, if you have any tonight and hope I can answer as well as Tony did to the press corps and to the world. So, questions. Any questions for the distinguished uh, gentleman from Gizme? Questions, anyone?
No. Ma'am. No, I do not. Uh, there's a strong movement for that, by the way, and I've certainly heard Ron Paul call Julian Assange and Edward Snowden um, American heroes. In fact, Julian Assange beamed in to Ron Paul's 80th birthday party, uh, calling him a great man and the like. But at the same time, there comes a very big risk in doing that, and that is that that's going to encourage other people to become whistleblowers with top secret material. So I do not believe he will pardon them. Then again, he pardoned former, or he commuted the sentence, I should say, uh, former Governor Blodojevich today, and he may well do it with Roger Stone. So you just really never know what you're gonna get when you say the words Trump and pardon together. Another question from Representative Hurtos. So it appears that the newest public figure target seems to be Attorney General Barr. Yes. What's your appraisal of that situation? He's going to be in that position for the rest of the administration and throughout a second term if he wants it. And let me tell you why. I spoke to a good source in the Justice Department who reminded me a thousand former Justice Department officials signed a letter criticizing him. Most of those are people who worked under Democrats and burrowed in because Republicans could never get their own to take the career jobs. The Democrats, on the other hand, uh, are perfectly willing to do it. Now he has 97% of the assistant attorneys general and bureau chiefs picked by him, picked by President Trump, rather, with his encouragement. Nearly all of the 94 U.S. attorneys have been picked under General Barr. In other words, he's not going to have anyone undercutting him, and he has the president's confidence. So I think that's one reason he's a target. And I find it very amusing, and I'll tell you why. This is not a Trump uh, creation, not a Trump ally. As a matter of fact, William P. Barr is a creation of the late President George H.W. Bush, who made him Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Office of Legal Counsel, Deputy Attorney General, and Attorney General, all before his 41st birthday. He's a Bush man and the embodiment of an establishment Republican, and yet he believes in serving the President who appoints him and therefore he's being criticized for it. I find that most amusing that his past and his history is never discussed at all. By the way, he's also a superb bagpipe player, among other things. Okay, anybody else? Sir. Uh, were you on an interview with uh, Walter Hudson a little while back? Yes. Uh, I thought I remember you saying that um, John Bolton wouldn't testify or wouldn't give up stuff about the Trump administration? I cited people who were close to Ambassador Bolton, and all of them said that no matter what was said out there, he would not only refuse to undercut the president, his testimony would help him in the end. And I can tell you, these are people who knew him, this includes David Keene, past president of the National Rifle Association, who hired him uh, as an intern during the Nixon administration, and Bruce Hershenson, best man at my wedding, uh, who teaches at Pepperdine University, who was a supporter of the John Bolton for President movement. These are people who know him well and have said that whatever he may say in private, when it comes to testimony, he would not push the president into the sea. And uh, they said have confidence in him. So you're confident that if he testified, which I think he said he would have, it wouldn't yes. have been negative? I'm confident that people that I've known a long time who have a relationship with him have assured me he wouldn't say those things. 
Okay. Well, I sound like I'm testifying. <laughs> Thank you. Don, anyway. you had a question back there. Get that to Don. I, I'm just kind of curious, uh, your, your opinion of the tone in Washington. I, I'm recently reminded that the Minnesota Constitution, when it was put together, the Democrats and the Republicans in the state would not speak to each other, so they had to sign two separate copies of the Constitution and then knit them back together. This hmm. is division that we don't see here. People talk about it's so divisive, so horrible now. No. In your opinion, you've had a long career. Do you think it's worse, better, particularly horrible? No. Uh, what do you think? I guess when you've been around and you've seen so much, nothing surprises you anymore. We go through times when people have disagreements and can get a little ferocious with it. But we've always had times like that. If you look back at Abraham Lincoln and look at the things said about him when he ran for president and ran for re-election, they're as bad, if not worse, than said about this president. Uh, in October of 1948, the New York Times on page one, Truman likens Dewey, his Republican opponent, to Nazis. And that is an absolute true headline. You have fierce rhetoric and it only seems a little more intent now because we have the social media that's out there. The fact is that if you're on Twitter, if you're on Facebook, I don't know about Instagram photographs, but if you're on any of these things, then it is very difficult to avoid getting invective and the very harsh language uh, about politicians or anyone. I went on Twitter primarily because an editor insisted I do it, and I rather enjoy it, uh, and I learn a lot of things about it. I also know that I can get pilloried for things, particularly any kind of article that's controversial. So I think it's about as bad as any times were. It's about as good as any times were. We just feel it a little more because we live in the age of social media. Andrew. Hi there, nice to meet you. Um, do you know anything about Congressman uh, Tim Murphy with his Iranian secret deal that they were trying to do? Now say the name again. Tim Murphy, Congressman from Connecticut. Uh, well, you're talking about Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut? Yes, please, sorry about that. No, no, I'm afraid I don't, and I'm sorry to say the Nutmeg State is my home state, and I'm not familiar with it. But I would just simply say that uh, in Connecticut, as in California, this is a state that is moving more democratic. It's much more democratic than Minnesota is. And you are going to find uh, intense dislike for Trump and opposition to him coming from just about everyone there. You're talking about a state that has not sent a Republican to Congress since 2008. And I can say that because I'm from Connecticut. Yes, sir. Ben? Yeah. Whoa. I was trying to use my outside voice, but I guess it wasn't enough. Uh, if, if the press is, is aware of, their, of the perception that's out there, because they had, you know, you talk about anonymous sources, and, and they don't seem very concerned about their credibility. They don't, and, and it's as if we are supposed to just believe them because they are in those positions. I'm reminded of, I visited the Congress in 1986, and I can't remember the players anymore, but I was in the, up, up above in the, in, the, in the balcony, and uh, someone said about my good friend who uh, was from the other side, and they went on about how they loved him and cared for him and all that, and I broke out laughing. And they said there'll be no laughing in the balcony. It was, it was, it was, it was un incredible. And, I guess I'm wondering, do, do the, does the press know how, how hard they need to fight for credibility? Absolutely. I think the fact that so much is televised and so much is online, you cannot be 
unaware of that. And I would just say that many of my colleagues out there uh, do not pretend not to be opiners and things. And that's fine. But with that comes the fact that they're going to get opposition. Speaking for myself, I like to just report the news. It's a great thrill to me to discover something that people don't know in advance. Uh, John mentioned Alan Riskind, my friend and mentor, our old editor, who used to infuriate me when he would say, I know this already. He said, everybody knows this. Tell me something I don't know. But he was absolutely right, and that's what I like to pursue. Now, if you are going to be an editorialist and an opiner, then you're going to get some kind of opposition. And this is why many stories and things on blogs have room for a response. And I read some of the response. It's pretty rough stuff. Um, I would just say, choose what you want to be, but then accept the consequences of it. Yes? Uh, two hypotheticals. Uh, should Trump win re-election and Nancy Pelosi is still speaker, will the Democrats impeach Trump again? No. I mean, they can figure out very easily that this one was a dud, basically. It did not sell. And Nancy Pelosi spoke at the Christian Science Monitor breakfast. I was seated one seat away from her when she was asked, do you want to see Donald Trump impeached? And she said, no, I want to see him defeated and sent to jail. It's all red meat for the supporters, but it wasn't enough red meat. She changed her view when she let AOC and Congresswoman Ilhan Abdullahani Omar push her too much. She's always got to defend her left flank all the time because eventually there's going to be a challenge. Nancy Pelosi's going to be 80 years old next month. She was um, a graduate of Trinity School in Washington when Pat Buchanan was graduating from Gonzaga Boys School, and I know how old both of them are. Uh, Steny Hoyer, the majority leader, 80 years old. Jim Clyburn, the whip, is 81. The stage is set for someone younger and farther to the left to take over. And I would just say that if that is the case, I hope they have learned their lesson because this did not help Democrats in any way. And uh, it certainly is not helping the eventual Democratic nominee for president. And if you think that's a partisan view, I would say the same thing about Republicans pursuing the impeachment of Bill Clinton. You'd be hard pressed to find anyone today who thought that was a good move to continue the impeachment when the Democrats nearly took over the House in 1998 and strengthened his hand for the 2000 elections. What's your other hypothetical? Okay. John and Jeremy both have questions over here. Thank you. Uh, given uh, what happened last uh, election cycle between uh, Bernie Sanders, say it out loud, Sanders, and Hillary Clinton, what do you think your appetite for the uh, Democrats is for a, a Bernie Sanders nominee, uh, given the superdelegates and how they run their deal there? Representative Heinrich, the superdelegates are barred from voting on the first ballot of the Democratic Convention. This was the rules change that was given to the Sanders supporters after the convention, ostensibly to bring them on board with Hillary Clinton. Uh, when I was riding with Gordon today, I had a phone call from Don Fowler, uh, the one of the two oldest living former Democratic chairman who's from South Carolina, and he was one of those who opposed the change but believes it should stay in place. So the superdelegates will not be there. I've just been in Iowa and I've been in New Hampshire, and since you brought the question up, I will tell you this. Bernie Sanders is in the position that Ronald Reagan was on the Republican side in 1980. He nearly won the nomination against the establishment favorite four years earlier. His supporters were wired, many of them accused of sitting on their hands and letting the other party win. 
uh, they're coming back very strong right now. And he did very well in Iowa. He won the popular vote. He won New Hampshire. He's ahead in Nevada right now. And Mr. Fowler from South Carolina said he's strong in the Palmetto State. Uh, now, you, I would say he gets to Super Tuesday. And Michael Bloomberg can spend all the money he wants, $350 million. A lot of that can be undone by one more comment about teaching the farmers <laughs> or likening Putin's annexation of Crimea to the U.S. annexation of California. Um, that kind of talk is just not going to sell well. I think I would not bet the farm, but I'd bet several acres the Democratic nominee will be Bernie Sanders. And if Bernie is a pragmatic and sharp politician, he'll pick as his running mate, Amy Klobuchar. Jeremy, you had a question. Well, yeah, John, that was really, I was going to ask the same question and what the odds were on a brokered convention at the DNC. So that was kind right. of the same, same line. Okay. And, and maybe the, on the, the rumor that Hillary Clinton could come out of the uh, brokered convention. Well, as Donald Trump said when asked about facing Hillary Clinton again, thank you, God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the idea of a brokered convention or even a multi-ballot convention is out of the question. It's like dusting off an old movie, quite frankly, to watch or colorizing a movie. The last time a convention went over one ballot was 1956, and that's when Adlai Stevenson, the Democratic nominee, threw open the selection of his running mate to the delegates and Tennessee Senator Estes Kefauver uh, narrowly beat the young Senator John Kennedy from Massachusetts for the nomination. And it was all very exciting to watch, very spontaneous. It was also at a time when delegates were chosen by parties in most state and operated as free agents and individuals. Hence, you could have the brokering, as you put it. Now, most of them are legally instructed uh, by their parties or more so by states in response to primaries. So 85% of the delegates will be selected by March 5th, Super Tuesday. And if that is the case, um, then I would say the chances are a nominee will have been selected by then. Yep. This gentleman, the former candidate for governor, against Norm Coleman wants to ask me a question. Well, she wants to ask oh, ma'am, Marcia. Thank you. So we've seen a lot of journalism um, decline, real journalism decline over the years. And I come from Duluth, Minnesota that has a one horse piece of paper that we see a, an opinion uh, article on the front page as news instead of in the editorial column. So this so-called journalist is making his opinion on the front page. What are the chances of turning the direction that journalism has gone in the indoctrination system, which is our colleges and our lower education, what is the chance of changing that direction in the next few years. Are there colleges that are actually teaching journalism or are they all falling into the same ideology of, uh, it's my opinion I want out there, it's, it's all about me, it's, it's not about the true story. Well, you've you just given me an opportunity, Marcia, to underscore something that John touched on. I met him because of the National Journalism Center, which I'm now on the board of, and I can tell you the young people who are coming up and want to be real journalists, shoe leather journalists, um, are growing. Now, a lot of that means that they have to understand that there is no ideology in that kind of journalism, that it's just basic shoe leather. Somebody was saying once, how did you uncover that the Secretary of Labor was out? And I said, a lot of shoe leather and a lot of lunches. And that's where these young people are coming from. You don't hear of them because you hear more, I think, 
about people who want to be future Woodward and Bernsteins, who want to be sexy journalists. Uh, it's interesting. So many people in the 1950s and 60s wanted to be lawyers because they loved watching Perry Mason on TV. And then, of course, you saw a lot of women join police forces after Angie Dickinson was the policewoman. And then Woodward and Bernstein were glamorized as reporters. One of the least glamorous businesses, I might add, that you could ever encounter. And they want to be like them. And hence, you have the gotcha journalism, uh, the idea of the journalism as the pundit on the Sunday talk shows, and the like. Well, I say to you that the people who are going to the journalism center that I know, they may not be in a majority, but they are numerous, and there will always be people who want to be out there who take up the words and admonition of Daniel Webster that there is nothing so powerful as the truth. Yes, sir. I have no doubt that you're maybe right about Bernie Sanders being the nominee, but I just have the suspicion that Bloomberg isn't going to give up so easily and may run in a primary. Uh, and if he does slide Hillary in there, it might be wild. Okay. You think? This being in Minnesota, let me tell you, sliding a candidate in or a nominee from a brokered convention are impossible. Uh, it's like drawing blood from a rock, uh, basically. Look, 1968 was the last time someone was nominated who had never entered a single primary or won any delegates competing in the primaries. And you know who that was? Hubert Humphrey. That is now illegal under democratic rules. You have to have competed in primaries. You have to have delegates elected in primaries, or you cannot be put in nomination for president. So Hillary Clinton cannot come out of a convention and cannot be slid in. Voters are not going to tolerate that anymore. Look, the Democratic Party is headed toward an eventual national primary. I saw that a former Democratic chairman the other day uh, called on Nevada to end its caucus and go for a primary system. I don't know if they'll do that or not. I don't know if the state of Nevada can afford a primary system because you pay for this, the taxpayers, when you do it. But the idea of sliding someone in who doesn't compete in the process is out of the question. File as an independent, I think, is what he's trying oh, to say. Oh, as an independent? Uh, many of the deadlines to be on the November ballot have passed already. Usually if someone is going to do that, uh, a Ross Perot, say, or the Libertarian Party, they either have to have presence on the ballot or they have to begin a process with petitions to get on the ballot. And that's become harder over the years. Individual states have made it more difficult to get third party or independent candidates on the ballot. Perot could do it because he planned early and had the money. I don't know that Hillary Clinton could. I see some people from greater Minnesota have a long way to go to get back home yet tonight and might be sure. fighting off uh, some uh, fatigue, but uh, if they put the presidential seal up here and they tried <laughs> to reinstitute the press conferences, I think, I think this guy could handle it, don't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But once again, let's thank John Gizzi for coming here tonight. Thank you all. Have a good night.